you ready to worship this morning? It was a powerful first service, and we're excited to worship. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my Till I
it this morning.
Hallelujah. The Lord bless you. Thank you, Pastor Joanna, for leading us in worship. Thank you, Pastor Kristen, for all that you do to lead and raise up our worship teams. We've seen so many great individuals come and go as the Lord has used them in other places, and uh, we just benefit so much from the hearts and talents of some great people. Amen. Wasn't it a great word last week? I know a long time has passed, but Pastor Spencer preached. He's the thinner guy. He was up here, and uh, he spoke about the word, the voice of the Lord. Uh, my friend once told me, he said, Paul, every sermon you preach is better than your next one. You've got to think about that. In other words, they all get worse. Just uh, really appreciate it, Pastor Spencer's word, and I want to build on that a little bit this morning. Um, <clears throat> I thought it was a great word. The only problem was it was a little bit too short. But I didn't hear any complaints. It reminds me of a business friend I had a number of years ago back in Newfoundland. They called him the golden boy. He'd go into businesses and turn them around. So he really knew what he was doing. And one morning he came up and he said, Paul, I love your word. But a piece of advice, he said, I've learned in the business world, once you make the sale, sit down. (laughs) So I've tried to incorporate that a bit, and I'm going to try to do that again this morning. I want to share a word from the book of Zechariah. You may or may not be familiar with Zechariah. It's the second last book in the Old Testament. But Zechariah was a prophet during the time when God was bringing his people Israel back to Jerusalem. You may remember, if you know the history, that there was a time in their history, about 500 years before Christ, where uh, they had been rebelling, doing their own thing, turned their back on God, and began to practice some real vile things. And so to chasten them and bring them back, God let them be captive and led away to Babylon. And in the process of that, the entire temple of Jerusalem that Solomon had built was destroyed, leveled. And so 70 years had passed, according to the prophet Jeremiah, and God raised up this man, Zerubbabel, and through the prophet Zechariah, he spoke to him. Under Zerubbabel's leadership, as well as Joshua, about 50,000 returnees came back to Jerusalem. And one of the first things Zerubbabel did, which he was commissioned to do, and the reason he came back was to rebuild the temple. And what he had done up to that point was he had uh, uh, established the floor of the temple and and had built the altar to bring the people back, to bring them back to their their practice of worship. Because he understood it wasn't enough just to be free from Babylon, just be free from oppression, but it was important to really become who they were called to be as God's people. And so worship, their relationship with God was central to that. And so that was really his mission. Well, they began to do that, and as you might appreciate, the neighboring communities or nations were really kind of upset that Israel was coming back because they realized that they did, that Israel very likely would become a superpower in the region again, so they tried to discourage the return. They tried to discourage the rebuilding of the temple. And so through their efforts, after a short period of time, Zerubbabel and the other people got really discouraged, and the, uh, the work that God had intended for them came to a grinding halt. And you know, I really think that's something that most of us this morning can relate to. We all know what it is to have seasons in our life, times in our lives, we know the Lord speaks something to us, or we just have a season where we're enthusiastic about the Lord and and, uh, something He's shown us or something He's done in our life, and off we go. We're off to the races. We're into the Word. We're being the witness we should. We want to grow in the Lord. The Lord's more real to us. But then again, the enemy always tries to oppose the work of God. And it's easy for us to become discouraged or even blindsided like this last season of several months where life just seems to be turned upside down, the world gets a little bit crazy, and we find our schedules change, life change, and before you know it, we've gotten away from our walk with the Lord, we've gotten away from the things the Lord's been doing in our lives, and we tend to kind of settle back, and we settle in, and we we kind of get into other pursuits, we start doing other things. Uh, One of the conversations we've had around the table as a staff on a pretty regular basis is just feeling uh, the desire, and I believe the Lord is doing it, but just again to get that traction, to get us back on track with what it was the Lord was doing in our midst and doing in our individual lives and as a congregation, what He was calling us to um, before all this craziness happened, not, a, not to allow those things to determine the mission God has given to us and the things that He's doing in our life and can still do through us, and even more so in these days in which we live, where more and more people are feeling, fe- feeling fearful and increasingly anxiety and all these other issues, we need to be a people of God who are moving with the Holy Spirit. So those are things that we can relate to uh, that happen in our life, and the same thing was happening in the life of Zerubbabel. And so what God does is he speaks to the prophet Zechariah, 
and he gives him a vision. And it's through that vision, he says, that image, he says, Zechariah, through this image, I'm going to show you the message that I want you to give to Zerubbabel. He was actually the governor of Judah, commissioned with this task. And God says, I know he's let us slide for quite a while. I'm giving you this image. I want you to interpret it to Zerubbabel because I want him to get back at what I've called him to do. So we go to the book of Zechariah chapter 4 and we read the first 10 verses. It says, and the angel who talked with me, this is Zechariah the prophet speaking, the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on the top of it and the seven lamps on it, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on this left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, are, uh, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. In other words, this imagery, this vision I'm showing you, I'm giving it to you in a way that you can understand and interpret what the word is. And here's my word. Say it with me. It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. We say that again. It's not by might. It's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? By mountain, he's referring to that obstacle that, that's in Zerubbabel's way, that discouragement, all the stuff that has caused him to stop doing his work. It's become a mountain. You ever feel that way? Like you were doing something, tracking a certain way, things were going well, and then you just kind of got away from that, and now it just seems like a mountain to get back at. You ever experienced that? In case you don't realize, Planet Fitness is opening a new, a new gym downtown. Right? Anybody feel the need to go to the gym? Right? You know, maybe you were, maybe you're healthier, whatever the case may be, but you come to a time it's like, oh man, I gotta get back in shape. And it's a great ambition, especially if you've seen a movie with, you know, strong guys or someone that looks really good. But to do it, it's a mountain. Right? It's not easy. And the same thing applies to many other areas of our life where the Lord is calling us to come back and to finish what has begun. He says, Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become level ground. And he shall bring forward, that's, that is Zerubbabel, he will bring forward the top stone that is the final piece of the puzzle when the building's complete with shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundations of this house and his hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice, and he shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. So God gives a vision to the prophet Zechariah through which he wants to interpret a message to his servant Zerubbabel. What's interesting is that this vision of the lampstand and the olive trees actually coincide perfectly with the vision we read in the New Testament that John has of two witnesses. Two men of God that God says in the last days, which may not be many, many years ahead of us, in the last days that two prophets are going to appear. It's very likely, according to Scripture, that it's going to be Elijah and Moses. Enoch may be in there somewhere as well. One of the two, we're not sure, but probably Elijah and Moses. The Bible actually says in Revelation 11, John, who writes, who writes the book, he refers to them as two olive trees and two candlesticks. And they are going to come into this world in the second half of Daniel's seven years. At the three and a half year mark, when it seems like all hell is breaking loose. In the world's darkest hour, when it seems that the Antichrist actually has power, unbridled power, all of a sudden these two men are going to appear. And they are going to be a light and a witness and Holy Spirit ministry that Satan himself is not going to be able to extinguish. There's a little bit of a rabbit trail here, but let me just say this very quickly. I think it ties into the days we're in. We can see the circumstances going on around us and just be discouraged. Just think, you know, everything's kind of out of whack, out of control. Where do we fit in this? Even so, come Lord Jesus. The world's kind of going crazy. Well, let me encourage you by saying, number one, this is just the beginning. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing, okay? So as the people of God, if we don't have discernment of the things that are going on now, we're going to be in a lot of trouble when things really begin to unpack. If we are a people who are just kind of going with the flow, hoping things work out, and we are not digging in as the Spirit of God is shaking things around us to say, listen, you need to understand something. You need to know me. You need to know me. you got to cut away the religiousness, cut away whatever it is you thought of me in the past. You have to know me as your God. 
Church ain't enough. Christian lifestyle ain't enough. Going with the flow ain't enough. There's a whole lot of trouble coming. But my people, they are going to be an inextinguishable light. Just like Moses and Elijah in these dark days, if they will be filled and led by my spirit. They will be a force that the enemy will not be able to extinguish. They will be a force that will actually penetrate the darkness and will shine light, shine truth on much of the fear and the, the, uh, the lies that people are being beguiled by today. John writes of these two witnesses in verse 6, they will have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. They will have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. And you know, my prayer is, Lord, I pray today that we would have a heart and a hunger that would say, Lord, rekindle your fire in us, your people. Let us be a people who burn brightly today in the time of such need around us. And so it's Moses and Elijah who also appeared with the Lord. You may remember the story in Mark chapter 9. Jesus goes up to a mountaintop. It's actually more of a high hill. He goes up there with three of his disciples, and in an instant, he is transfigured, which just simply means that the, the glory, the light of God just shines through him. Peter's all beside himself because he sees Moses and Elijah appear, and he wants to build tents for them. And, and you know, the voice basically says, Peter, you know, step aside, we're doing something here. And so, uh, so that experience takes place called the Mount of Transfiguration, but it's Moses and Elijah who appear. Moses and Elijah actually represent the law, Moses, right? God brought the law through Moses, and the prophets or the prophetic ministry, which is who Elijah was, one of the greatest prophets of all time. And so we bring from Revelation chapter 11... Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, the, the two candles, the two olive trees, and we marry them with this vision that Zechariah has here in Zechariah chapter 4, and we see they're essentially of the same thing. The importance of that is this. When we're, we're going back to this idea in Zechariah of the lampstand, what does that mean? The olive trees, what does that mean? I think it means simply this. The law and the lampstand are one and the same, and they speak to the Word of God. So here's the scenario. There's this unfinished task that looks like a mountain to Zerubbabel. God wants Zerubbabel to get back on track. He fully intends to finish what he started in Zerubbabel. He has a destiny for the nation. He says, listen, you've shut down for a while, but I still have a great work that I want to do through you. So I'm going to show you two things that are going to be required and that are available to you to make sure this gets done. The first thing he says I want you to know is this light. This light is my word. My word to you has life in it, and it never extinguishes. In other words, Rubel, what I told you to do at first, I'm going to do. If you work with me, it's going to happen. You don't have to make it happen. It's going to happen. It's my word. I'm going to do it, but I need you to cooperate with me. Anybody relate to that? right? God speaks the word to us. And maybe for a long time, it's been dormant. Maybe you go through a season of life, something throws you a curveball, just life happens, business, whatever it may be, pressures against you. We can give up on that dream. We can say, oh, well, that was for a time. And we may forget about it, but God has not forgotten about it. His word to you, his promise concerning you, it may be your own heart, your ministry, your life, your marriage, your children, your finances, whatever it may be. God speaks a word to you, and he says, this word is from me to you. In fact, the Bible says what in Psalm 119? My word is a lamp to your feet and a light to your pathway. In other words, when you learn to walk in obedience to my word, I will give you just enough light that you know where the next step is. You're not always going to have the full picture, but it'll be a lamp to your feet. You'll know where to go if you'll abide in my word. And then I'll also show you as you get down the road, you can turn around and see how far you've traveled because step by step you've walked in obedience to my word. So the Bible is God's living word, and as we read it, what does the Lord do? He says, okay, now we're going this way. Okay, now we're going this way. He's not, he's not jerking us around, but he's leading us step by step very deliberately. And so his promise is if we'll obey his word to us, then his purpose for us will not be extinguished. And I just want to encourage you this morning. The word that God has spoken to you, and only you know what that is. Only you know what the dream of your heart has been. And whatever situation may concern you, God speaks to you if you will turn to him and hear him. 
And the word he speaks to you, he says in Isaiah, he says, my word will accomplish all I want it to and prosper everywhere I send it. So in other words, when God has something for us, when he has placed something in our heart by way of here's where I want to advance you, here's where I want to grow you, here's where I want to bring a release to something, I want to change something, he says, I'll give a word to you. And that word cannot be extinguished by the enemy. Then there's also the olive trees or the prophetic that I believe are the same thing as well. And what that speaks to me about the Lord saying is not only have I a word for you, but I've also made available to you the flow of the Holy Spirit in your life. He is the one who's going to give you revelation. He is the one who's going to speak to you about things that are yet out there. But he wants you to see as much of the plan as he, in his wisdom, knows you need to see because he wants you to know that he's moving you forward. That walking with Jesus is not just sitting around, right? It's a walk. It, it actually accomplishes something. There's goals. There's measures of growth. There's change. There's maturity. And so he says you have the Word of God and you have the Spirit of God in order to give you the fuel to guarantee the completion of what it is that I have spoken to you. And so the vision was God's way of saying to Zerubbabel, as he says to you and me, I am going to fulfill the dream I've placed in your heart. Now, that might sound like a cliche, but I want to encourage you this morning. If you don't have a dream, you need to pray and ask the Lord for one. Because the Lord says, I have a dream. We quote it all the time. What does he say in Jeremiah? I have a plan for you, says the Lord. It's not a plan to harm you. It's a plan to give you hope and to give you what? A future. I want you to know that you're going somewhere. I want you to know that I have a plan that I want to work in your life. However humdrum or routine life may be to you, that's not the plan I have for you. I have a plan for you, as Jesus said, that you might experience life to the full. In other words, a life that blossoms. A life that goes from strength to strength, from revelation to revelation. That is the life Jesus died and shed his blood for us to actually experience. And so the Lord wants us to understand he has that for us. And he says, the flame of my word will never be extinguished. The oil of my provision will never run dry. But here's the key. It's not going to happen by your effort. That's the key. That doesn't mean we don't have to choose to participate. That doesn't mean that there's not work and discipline going to be involved along the way. But the Lord says in his word here, you need to understand it's going to be the Holy Spirit that actually makes the plan come together. In other words, the Lord says, I'm not only the one who sees the plan I have for you, I'm the one who's going to see it through. But there's a key here. He says in Philippians, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. In other words, I believe God's word to Zechariah is a reminder to you and me that the Lord says, I have dreams for you. I have assignments for you. And I want to complete them. And I want you to give thought to those things that have maybe been buried in your heart for a long, long time because I want you to understand that I want you to complete the task that I've given to you. Let me just ask you, what are some things you've been exposed to in your walk with God? What are some things He's maybe done through you? What are some things He's shown you that have excited your heart? What are some signs of life you've seen in different areas of your life? But if you're not careful, you begin to kind of drift backwards. You ever have that happen? You just kind of begin to drift backwards, and enough time goes by that you think, ah, you know, that, I had my shot, but I, I didn't make it. You ever feel that way? I have. Yeah, I mean, I can remember when God did this or this, and, but man, it's been a long time since I've tracked in that. I mean, I just feel like I had my shot. I just kind of let God down, or I didn't keep it up. The Lord says, listen, my word to you is still alive. My promise to you is still there. What I've begun in you, I'm going to complete. The gift I've given to you, the way I've worked in your life, what I've called you to, what excited your heart, whatever it was, at whatever time it was. Listen, I've not forgotten that. You may have allowed yourself to be discouraged. Circumstances may have changed. Something may have come against you. But my word to you is the same. In fact, the scripture says that the gifts of God are without regret. God never gives them and says, oh, I made a mistake. I didn't know he was going to go through this hard time. I didn't know he was going to slack off or she was going to slack off. No, nothing surprises the Lord. He's just saying, listen, I'm just waiting for you to get back on track. I'm just waiting for you to understand, I never expected you from the beginning to pull it off yourself. It's not by your effort that it's going to happen. 
It's not by your effort that that thing that began in you is going to be completed. It's going to be by you understanding what it means to walk with me in sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you this morning to believe for what God has promised you and not to settle for less. I want to encourage you, and I want you to think about it as I mention it, I want to encourage you to finish the assignments that God has spoken to you about. We always have a lot of goals on January 1st. Well, let me ask you, and just think about this. What are some of the assignments God has given to you over this past year, even during the COVID season? Has the Lord spoken to you and said, hey, I want you to use this season to grow? I want you to use this season to maximize your, your quiet time with me. I want, to, I want to build you up, or I want to work on your marriage, or I want to get your finances in order. Whatever it may be that he's speaking to you, the Lord says, I want to complete those assignments. I don't want you to be discouraged by either the slow progress you've seen or by the fact that maybe some area seems to be shut down. But he says, I also want you to understand that it's only going to be a possibility by my grace. By my grace. Say that word. Grace. What is grace exactly? Well, many of us have grown up hearing the definition that the grace of God is simply the undeserved love or kindness that God shows toward us. And I believe that's a beautiful definition. But I want us to understand that grace is more than a feeling. We talk about amazing grace, and we have this sense of just kind of goosebumps and feeling good, and that, that certainly is part of it. But the grace of God is not a feeling. The grace of God is a power that is released to us, that follows His Word, that, that energizes us to actually move into what He has for us. The grace of God is not only what frees us from sin, but the grace of God continues to give us focus. The grace of God speaks to us and says, hey, we're going this way. Hey, hey, come on, let's go, let's go, let's get up, let's, let's break out of this dryness, let's move forward. The grace of God is the power He gives us to rise above the struggles that make us want to settle when there's still so much more way ahead of us. The grace of God moves in our life and says, come on now. You know I'm real. You've experienced some good things. You know that word was for you. You know that thing I'm doing in your life. You can see me working here or there. Now let's get going. Let's keep moving. Let's get this thing done. The Bible says in Romans 8, 14, that all who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. You see, I find a lot of Christians who if they're really honest, they say, well, Pastor, you know what? I believe in Jesus. When it comes to really being led by the Lord, I've just kind of found like I've tried Jesus and some things and he, he just didn't come through. You know, I tried Jesus and he didn't work. Now, we wouldn't say that, but we kind of lived that way. We kind of just settle back into a good Christian lifestyle as best as we can. Tried Jesus, he didn't work. I would, I would, I would, I would uh, argue with you that you really didn't try Jesus. You didn't really try him at all. You, you, you didn't really give yourself to him completely. What you did was you kind of acknowledged him until things became difficult. Or when he brought you up against something where maybe a part of you has to die. Your flesh, your feelings, your desires, your, your preferences. And then the Lord says, okay, I need you to die here. He said, no, 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 Lord. <laughs> no, no, thanks. I'll take it over from here. And we settle into a Christian lifestyle. But we stop there. We never grow beyond that in our walk with the Lord, at least in what he intends for us. He says, all who were led by the Spirit of God, Paul says, are children of God. You see, following Jesus is more than just listening to the objective truth of God's Word. What I mean by that is a lot of Christians say, okay, here's what the Bible teaches, and I'm going to try real hard to do that. Now, that's a part of it, but that's not the fullness of it. What it means to be led by the Spirit is that I not only have the objective truth of God's Word, which is so vital, but I also have the subjective voice or leading or prompting of the Holy Spirit day by day, decision by decision. He will bring the Word of God to my, to my remembrance as I need it, but I have to be open to the prompting of the Holy Spirit when He touches me and wants to move me in a different way or in a different direction or just wants me to get out of the way and begin to lean on Him. Zechariah said in verse 1, The angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who's awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? Now, Zechariah wasn't sleeping because he had been ministering at this time. He'd been prophesying. So he, he wasn't technically asleep. But basically, he's prophesying, ministering. Then the Holy Spirit kind of just touches him on the shoulder. It's okay, now we're going this way. I want you to say this. Friends, one of the greatest barriers to spirit-lived uh, living, one of the greatest barriers to truly walking with Jesus 
is simply routine. Routine. We get up, we have breakfast, get the kids ready if we have them, get ourselves ready, go to work, come home, put supper on, clean the dishes, maybe get some homework done. Hopefully somewhere in there we try to find a few minutes to have some devotions or read a chapter of the Bible or something. We go to bed, go through the week, Saturday comes, we've got a day off, we've got a whole list of chores we have to do. And hopefully we get a chance to relax a little bit. We very easily are given to routine. routine. Even if you're ministering through the week, involved in ministry, it doesn't mean you're being led by the Spirit. It doesn't mean you're being carnal. I don't mean it that way. But it doesn't mean that you're being sensitive in the midst of all that business to the Holy Spirit when He taps you on the shoulder and says, okay, I'm doing this now. Pay attention. I'm doing something over here. Or I'm leading you in a different way. You may know the story in 2 Samuel chapter 5. David had just been anointed king of Israel. And so everybody knows David's reputation in the surrounding nation. They know he's a great warrior. They know he's a man of prayer, a man who knows God. God's done great victories through him. They know he beat the Philistines, Goliath, all that kind of stuff. And so they decide, listen, he's just been anointed king. The Philistines say, we've got to go after him. We've got to try to destroy them and try to nip this in the bud. And so this is David's real first test as the king of Israel. And what he does is he seeks the Lord. And the Lord tells him, this is what I want you to do. This is how you're going to come against them. David follows what the Lord says, defeats most of them, scatters the rest. Now, the enemy, after they scattered, they reassemble and they're coming back for a second attack. David gets wind of that, but what does he do? He does something that a lot of times we don't do. David sought the Lord again. Now, that wouldn't even make sense for most of us. It's the same day, same enemy, same battle, right? What does David do? He doesn't do the same thing. You see, we go so accustomed. Our, our flesh, the way we operate is, okay, God, just show me what to do, right? We go to prayer about something. What are we saying? Lord, just, would you just tell me the five things I need to do to fix this? Maybe men tend to do that more than women. I don't know. Women are more intuitive. They're, they're smarter, okay? But that's what we tend to do. Because what we're saying is, Lord, I got to get back to my life. I got things to do. I just, gotta need, I just need this fixed. The Lord says, no, your answer is not getting that fixed. Your answer is me. Your answer is learning to hear my voice, letting me get involved. Your answer is letting me do it and you walking with me as I show you what to do and what not to do so that you don't get in my way. So I can actually bring a real resolution to this. I can actually work a miracle in this situation because your flesh can't do it. My spirit can do it, but you've got to allow my spirit to work. You've got to step back a little bit sometimes, and you've got to allow the Holy Spirit to have His way to do His thing. Zechariah says, you need to show grace to that thing, grace to that mountain. And by showing grace, it's not just some kind of superstitious mantra where you just kind of speak a few words and then you hope for the best. Grace is the release of God's power into your life that comes as an act of your own will, when rather than taking matters into your own hands, you step back, you channel that energy that you would use to make things happen, which aren't going to happen anyway, you instead channel that to spend time with the Lord, to sit back with Him, so that He can actually do what it is that needs to be done. David said, this was done by the Lord, and it's a wonderful thing to see. A wonderful thing to see. And the Lord says, I want you to see those things in your life. But you've got to understand that what I planned for you, you've got to understand the things, the dreams I've given to you, the things that I want to awaken in you, they're not going to happen by you just trying harder. They're going to happen by you learning to understand that it's not by your effort. It's by the flow of my Spirit in your life, through your life, leading you, you waiting on me, and don't move until I tell you to. That's what happened with David. Because what he did was he waited on the Lord. The Lord said, David, okay, thank you for checking it again because i got a different plan this time. What I want you to do, David, I want you to go over by those balsam trees. Another, another translation calls them mulberry trees. I want you and your men, the enemy's reassembled, the enemy's coming at you. David, I just want you to go over by those trees. What do I want you to do? I want you to wait there until the leaves begin to rustle and the wind blows. Then you will move out. Why? Because that will be a sign to you that I'm now moving. And as I'm moving, you come along with me. I'm going to win this battle. You'll be part of it, but it's going to be my doing because you're moving with me when I'm moving. That is so hard for us to do, isn't it? Right? We just tend to say, okay, Lord, it it seems common sense. I mean, you know, I, I dealt with it a certain way last time. Why not this time? It's just normal things. 
What does the Bible say, Proverbs 3, 4, 3, 4 and 5? And I just went, just went blank. Trust in the Lord. <laughs> That's right. Do not lean on your own understanding, but in what? All of your ways. Acknowledge him, and he will direct you. So what do you do? Rather than going after, expending energy, trying to make things happen, even in the name of ministry or good things, instead you say, Lord, I'm going to step back. I'm going to lean into you first. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to submit to you. And I'm going to say, Lord, I'm not going to move on that until I see you moving. And I'm going to ask that you would just give me wisdom and grace to understand what you're doing and participate with you, but I'm not going to try to make it happen. And the Lord says when you learn to live that way, you begin to see him do incredible things, bringing plans together, changing hearts, changing lives, changing what atmospheres, whatever it may be. Sometimes it happens quickly. Sometimes it can be several months or years, but you see the Lord doing it, and you can stand back and say, wow, God. I mean, have you ever had that experience? Sometimes it's despite us. You know, in spite of what we do, the Lord is gracious. But we stand back and say, Lord, I don't know how you brought that together. And it says, because you stayed out of the way. You see, you waited for me, and when I was moving, then you began to move. The Lord says in Isaiah 30 and 15, come back and quietly trust in me. Then you'll be strong and secure. The Spirit-led life is a life that's lived from rest. Rest does not mean inactivity. Rest means that our activity is to hold still while God does what he needs to do. Jesus called that abiding. And so I want to encourage us this morning, whatever your mountain may be, whatever that assignment, whatever that project that you began, God began, wherever that place where you were or your marriage was or whatever it may be concerning you, that's not what it should be, that's not been complete. And you look at that and you say, that's just something that I'm never going to be able to address. I'm never going to get a handle on that. It's just always going to be a reminder of my failure or a reminder of what's incomplete. That becomes a mountain to us. And the Lord says, I want you to look at that mountain. And he says this, Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become level ground. And he shall bring forward the top stone. Put that last stone in place amid shouts of grace. Grace to it. The Lord wants us to understand that there's nothing that he has begun in us that he does not want to finish and that he will not finish. It's a simple word this morning. But as Pastor Spencer mentioned last week, the voice of the Lord, that word of the Lord, when he comes to you, it has power to shake mountains. It has power to birth new things, to bring life where there's no life. Friends, these are not just metaphors. They're not just nice little imagery in, in the Scriptures. This is the word of God to us. And he says, I want to awaken the dream I've given to you. That's why Paul said to Timothy, and I say to some of you this morning, the Lord wants you to stir up the gifts that he's given to you. He wants you to lay hold of things you've had taste of that you know are the work of God, things he's called you to that maybe you've gotten away from and said, well, somebody else seems to flow better in that or I'm not as talented as them or it's just been a long time. The Lord says, no, my gifts are without regret. Every gift I've given to you, I want it to flourish. I want it to grow. In our culture, we're so used to things happening overnight that if they don't, we just tend to give up. And the Lord says, don't give up. Whatever the reason may be that has shut you down, I want you to understand I've given you the gift and you are the one who's going to lay the capstone and say, last piece, it's done. You're the one. I've not given it to somebody else. I've not forgotten you. So just for somebody out there this morning, there may be many of us here this morning, whatever it is the Lord has gifted you, called you to, stirred in your heart, for you, your family, your marriage, your finder, whatever it may be, the Lord says, listen, I've not forgotten. You may have given up, only part of it started and you forgot it. You've walked away from it. I've not forgotten it. I want to bring you back to it. I want you to show you this and say, that's, my, that's still my word for you. However much water's been under the bridge, whatever sin you may have been entangled in, however far you drifted away, whatever the reason may be, my promise to you hasn't changed. But I want you to know it's not going to happen by you just trying harder. It's going to happen by you understanding it's by my Spirit, says the Lord. In fact, one of the reasons why it may not have been completed in your life was because you began to take the reins over again. You began to try to do things in your own power. Or you settled back into a Christian lifestyle. You've gotten away from your time with me. Whatever it may be, the Lord says, I've not forgotten. 
let's get back at it. Can anybody relate to that? Anybody? I can. I mean, the, the staff must be so tired of hearing me because I keep using the word traction. Like, I just feel this coming year is just a year, and even now, is just traction. God, I pray, just for, like, take the wheels off, give me tractor tracks, and I just want to begin to get over some of those things, that, you know, those new areas the Lord has been calling us to, where it seems like you just kind of get there and go back, or you get there and you hit your head against the wall and saying, Lord, I just pray for grace. Grace, Lord, just one last burst of your Spirit to get over that once and for all, back into that new level that you have of intimacy, of ministry, of compassion, of holiness, whatever it may be the Lord is calling us to. I'm going to wrap up with this. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, By the grace of God, I am what I am. And he didn't mean that, oh, by the grace of God, I'm not messed up. You know, oh, by the grace of God. No. no, by the grace of God, when I look at my life, when I look at what God did through someone like me, short, and by the way, that's what the name Paul means. If you didn't know that, it means short in stature, right? That's, that's why names are so important. Parents, when you name your children, recognize there's weight in the names. Don't do this to us. I should have been 6'4". But Paul means short of stature. And Paul is saying, I am what I am. When I look at my life, when I look at, yeah, I was a brainiac and I had all the education, all that kind of stuff. That's not a bad thing. But I realized that in that, all I had was frustration. I just, I just, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't fulfilled. There wasn't a sense of, of joy and fulfillment. But when I look at my life, and I see what God's done through this simple life that I offer to Him, I say it's by the grace of God. And God's grace is a power unleashed in my life. He goes on to say, I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. Let me ask you this morning, is God's grace for, to you, is it at work this morning, or is it in vain? The things God has shown you, done for you, provided for you, revealed to you, released in you. Have those things been in vain? They don't need to be. He says, not in my life. No, I worked harder than all of them. In other words, I took the discipline and hard work along with the grace. And he says, but not, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. The grace of God that was in me. Friends, if we could just see what Jesus sees, when he looks across this audience and this platform, what he sees in us, not just himself, his spirit, but everything he's dreamed for us, every desire he's placed in our heart, every longing, every promise that he says, it is still for you, it hasn't changed. But our work is not in earning grace. Our work is learning to rest in the Holy Spirit, to not move until he moves, and then to watch him do what needs to be done. You see, God knows what's out ahead of us. God knows the things that concern us. He knows the things that have potential to weigh us down and distract us from what He's really called us to and what He plans for us. But what the devil does, he wants to get our eyes on those things and he wants it to make us feel like our lives are essentially aimless. But you know, it's really hard to do that when you have a heart that says, I see, enemy, what you're doing. I see those things that are still incomplete. And even this morning, the Holy Spirit has awakened me to, to those things He's placed on my heart and the things He's calling me to. But I understand that I can't make it happen myself. I look at those things and I say, Mountain, I'm not going to fight you anymore. Mountain, I'm not even going to try to scale you. I'm going to step back. I'm going to abide in the Lord. And I'm going to watch Him shrink you. Because I can't do it. And when you look at those things this morning, we're going to close with a song. But I want to encourage you, whatever it is, it may be unfulfilled dreams. It may be a broken relationship. It may be spiritual dryness. It may be a gifting or a calling that you were exposed to and it's been months since you've walked in that anymore and you thought, well, God must be so frustrated with me, I probably can't even dream of picking that back up again. Whatever it is, the Lord would say, don't be discouraged. Don't look at it thinking that you have to make something happen. What you need to do is look at it and say, I speak grace to you. I can't do it, but I'm releasing the Holy Spirit in that thing, in that relationship. Lord, I'm releasing the flow of the Holy Spirit in that thing that has lost its life that you want to bring back to life. It's by the Spirit. The Lord says, abide in me, and I will abide in you. 
And whatever it is that I've placed in your heart by way of a dream or a hope or a plan, he says, I will bring it to pass. My word and my spirit and all the powers of hell cannot extinguish the flame of my purpose for you. But you're not the one who pulls it off. I'm the one. Isn't it so much better when the Lord gets the credit? When he does things in a way and all we can say is, I don't know how he did it. All I know, like Moses, I just stood back and watched the Lord do it. I stared out of his way and then I moved when I saw him move. I acted when I saw him act. I spoke when I saw him speak. That's called abiding. That's called living from a place of rest.